Right. So, so thank you for the introduction, Maya, and thank you for the invitation, first of all. Um, it's have, I'm happy to see such a large number of students, uh, and I hope this will be uh, an interesting uh, conversation and presentation for all of you. So, um, first of all, uh, um, so Maya has already introduced myself, so for the sake of time, uh, I'll, um, I'll spare you that. Um, I would just uh, like to, uh, to tell you something uh, on, or on the way uh, I would like to run this lecture. So it's my understanding uh, that um, the lectures have been uh, mostly the traditional lectures uh, with the speaker talking and uh, you mostly listening. I don't want to do just that. So uh, I will ask, ask uh, uh, several questions and I want your input. So I think this will uh, hopefully make it more interesting and more engaging for you. And uh, it also helps me uh, to better understand what you're understanding, what you're not. And uh, that way uh, it, uh, it allows me to change things a bit. So uh, with that in mind, then uh, let's uh, dive in right away on, on our topic. So um, based on the, the readings, uh, on the title of the lecture, who can give me a bit of an overview uh, of, uh, of the readings and of what we're going to do, uh, uh, well, for me this afternoon, maybe for some of you morning or evening. No need to be shy. This is not uh, an assessment. Go ahead, John. I think uh, the lecture will mostly be about, um, you know, the history, like past, present, the future of uh, like financial regulations uh, with regards to like uh, markets, banks, and um, just uh, the control of finance and currency in general. Yeah. So uh, you can think of, uh, we're going to look at uh, what drives financial regulation and certain political and historical aspects that uh, influence financial, more, financial regulation and more than uh, usually it's described. So usually financial regulation is presented as something uh, uh, that uh, is born almost uh, uh, very pure uh, and uh, perfect, uh, but as we'll see, uh, it's uh, it's product of uh, human behavior, so it has uh, these political uh, and historical aspects that we'll delve in a bit. Um, Isabel, do you have a question or do you want to add uh, uh, something? I just want to add on like banking um, regulations, constraints on um, banks. Yeah. So. Uh, now, can someone give me just a very brief uh, overview uh, of the papers? Maybe a couple of sentences on uh, on each one. For the first paper, oh, oh, for the first paper, um, uh, what I've read was um, like the history of banking regulation, so from Civil War to Great Depression. I found yep. that really interesting. So how um. Oh, like there are two competitors, like state and federal regulations, um, trying to incentivize um, um, the establishment of banks. Um, but then there are also unit bankers, which doesn't want to um, want like branch, uh, branching laws to be um, established. So I think that was really interesting. All right. Uh, what about the other ones? So I don't know who was the other person who talked, uh, if you want to. Uh in the second paper, they were talking about like the difference between different types of systems. I think it was like mutual mutual guarantee systems and like uh, like how it was affecting like federal deposit insurance and just yeah. how they use those different systems to regulate banks. And then also on how would deposit insurance originated in the US, which uh, again, it was a very political process and uh, not uh, that much uh, uh, a typical or the, the way uh, typically financial regulation is portrayed to be uh, built on. Um, what about the other three? Um, does someone else want to go in or? Uh, the, yeah, John, go ahead. The last one was kind of about the, the origins of like federal deposit insurance. And it kind of talked about the other countries adopting it after the US. 
because of the change in public opinion. So which paper are you talking about, uh, Ria? Um, I think that was the last paper. So the last paper, it's more on the 1980s. Uh, um, I think it was titled, it didn't, it just was titled The Origins of Federal Deposit Insurance. Okay, so that's the one uh, that uh, Nia was talking about. So, oh, uh, yes, so yeah. sorry. Uh, I was asking for the next ones to keep it moving. Uh, do you want to uh, uh, to give a brief overview of the other ones? Or? Oh, sorry, I did this one. I didn't realize that Nia already talked about it. Sure. Uh, John, go ahead then. The one about the deregulation was uh, like a history of how, um, you know, the, uh, the the 1970s and I think like you can even go further back into like the the post Keynesian world of like the 50s and 60s led to the rise of neoliberalism and then like it, how it set this for uh, neo Keynesianism later on. Yeah. What about the other two? Any takers? You can repeat, even if you have already spoken, you can uh, you can speak again. Yeah, Tasmia, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Yeah, yeah, you are. If not yeah. correct, um, my, correct me. Yeah, as John mentioned, I think that was one of the papers that I looked deeply into because I remember in my history class we're actually learning about, which isn't often taught in the curriculum. Um, it does go into depth about how between the Great Depression and during like the 1970s to 1980s, how there's like a different like favored stability between banking regulations and how like it has more competition between like these times and it led to like an unstable system. All right, yeah. So what about the other two papers? Any takers for either Hajan's paper or the, the cycle? I think we were only given three, I might be wrong, but three and then the syllabus was what we were given, I think. Okay, well, I sent five, uh, so that changes uh, things a bit, but it's good to know, thank you. Um, Okay, so wait, you have White's paper, uh, the, the one written by Calomiris and White, and then you have the one on the, uh, the advent of the new banking system. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so just this three. Okay, so this changes a bit the context um, because the last one was supposed to be uh, the last one out of five. So the other two uh, would introduce uh, a bit on this one, but uh, all right, uh, I'll take that into account. So nonetheless, uh, the first two papers that I'd like to discuss would be uh, the um, two that you have. So the first one would be the uh, uh, white single author paper. Uh, on the on financial regulation between the Civil War and the Great Depression. So um, I think this paper paints well uh, from a historical perspective the, the political uh, actions. So how, um, how does White uh, view or present uh, the the evolution of, uh, of financial regulation in this uh, period in the US. You could argue this is true for probably all periods everywhere, but how does he portray it? Portrays it a lot as a competition between uh, different regulators trying to, you know, uh, in this case, it was a, a really like a race to the bottom oftentimes of decreasing regulations, decreasing, you know, minimum capital requirements, things like that. And the game, it has regulators, but who else is part of that game? Government. Like, like the government uh, lobbies and stuff, the lobbies? Public? Well, the government is a regulator. Right, uh, right. So the government the is one of the regulators. But right, right. he explicitly names three groups and regulators are one, but who else? I've already heard someone uh, say something, uh, John and... Uh, uh, well, yeah, Isabel, was that you? Oh. Or? 
Yeah, I said public. Yeah, public is another group. And who else? Maybe the most the uh, banks themselves. obvious. Yes. So the banks have plenty of interest in banking regulation. Right. So it does paint uh, this, uh, this picture of uh, uh, financial regulation being uh, the product of these uh, political struggles, right, between these different groups. And uh, sometimes it does involve uh, two different groups of regulators, as Pranav uh, mentioned. In, he gives the example of state and federal regulators. But sometimes it's also uh, a game between uh, the different interests of the public, who you can think as voters for, um, uh, for, for, government, for members of government, but at the same time, depositors to banks, right? And this is kind of the same group. And then on the other hand, you have banks who are the ones regulated by it. And uh, um, uh, the other one, uh, it's the regulators. So the government, whether it's at state or federal level. And these different groups may have different interests. And based on these interests, they're going to uh, pursue different, uh, different types of actions that then uh, lead us to the outcome of, uh, of financial regulation, right? Then, uh, is this clear so far? Are there any questions? Okay, so then uh, he goes a bit into more detail and gives a few examples. Um, so uh, Pranav, you, you already kind of mention uh, a bit one of them. Uh, do you want to elaborate on it? Uh, was it the example I gave of the state and federal or what, what was, it, was it a different example I gave? Yeah, yeah, that's oh, that one. Yeah, yeah, so um, I remember it was talking about how um, after the Civil War, um, especially, we saw, you know, as this like West, like a lot of this westward expansion and things like that was happening. We saw like um, a lack of banks in terms of supply banking services available in a lot of these areas. And so, um, and, and we also saw at the same time, a lot of regulation that was there in, in the past, right? And so that limited the banking supply. And so the response in a lot of areas was, let's decrease those regulations so that we can increase the number of you know, banking services that are available to address that demand from the public. Um, okay, so then there's also a broader uh, history there. So uh, first, maybe if we go back a little bit to the origins of the country. So the US uh, starts as uh, a country without a very strong federal government that uh, uh, most of the power initially it's at the state level. And that's where banks start to originate. It's at the state level, they get state um, charters to uh, perform banking operations in those states. And these usually were given almost for just one branch. So this leads to the unit banking uh, that we later dis that uh, it's later discussed. And part of what drives this is the need for revenues by the states. So giving uh, issuing bank charters, uh, banks had to pay for them. So this was an important source of revenue at the time. And initially, the federal government didn't have much power, right? However, then um, as the 19th century progresses, the federal government uh, tries to acquire more power. And uh, that's one of the reasons that leads to the civil war with the conflict between uh, the, the federal government and some states over, uh, the, over the, slave, the slavery, right? And then uh, um, it's also, the states that uh, the Confederate states were also the ones bearing more the federal government from intervening, exactly because they didn't want intervention uh, on uh, issues uh, related with agriculture, like slavery. But this also made them uh, prevent the federal government from intervening or from regulating banking. So it's not a coincidence that the first uh, national banking acts are during uh, the, the civil war when the southern states were away. Because at this point you have the states that uh, are uh, more, uh, more keen or more in line uh, with the, uh, the federal government 
So then they start promoting more a national banking system, right? And that's the point in which uh, then you start, you have these, uh, uh, these dual regulators, the state and the federal, like Pranav uh, mentioned, right? So um, this is a bit uh, of the origin that make the, the, the US system a little bit peculiar. Right, it's, uh, it starts uh, with, a, with a system that's almost just state level, and then it's introduced the federal level. Um, recently, so uh, currently state banks, they exist in terms of charter, but every bank has a federal regulator. So this, uh, this level of competition is not as much in play now because every state bank well, state still issues uh, charters, and there are such a things as state banks, banks that can only operate in a state and that have a state charter. Now, every bank in the US is regulated uh, by uh, at least one federal agency. Um, so, uh, all right. Um, so yeah, so that was the part on the dual banking system. Um, and then uh, what is the, the main example that uh, White gives for, uh, for this competition between uh, banks, regulators, and the public? Yes, so tell me how to pronounce your name. Uh, um, I go by Ark. I go by Arco. Arco. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I think the main issue was the branching of the banks. Yes. And basically, um, unit banks didn't want um regulators to allow more branching because they, because that would negatively affect them because there would be more competition. Obviously, larger city banks have an advantage there. And on the other hand, the uh, city banks and like state regulators and federal regulators obviously wanted banking, I mean branching, as it benefited their banks. And um, in the end, uh, basically it was kind of like a stalemate um, in the Congress. Um, reg um, regulators and then unit banks, they both lobbied them um, to pass regulation in their favor. But then in the end, um, I think they were kind of like, kind of like a seesaw with like, uh, some regulations were passed that helped branching and then others were passed that kind of revoke those again. And yeah. So more were passed that didn't help branching. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, uh, there was a lot of legislation that uh, prevented branching. So you are correct. So this is a good example uh, of, uh, of kind of the political game that you could uh, in which you can conceive financial regulation right so you have different types of banks lobbying uh, on their interests you have different regulators involved and all of these groups lobby the public so um, as white also points out uh, the um, there was also uh, uh, a more public uh, um, or so kind of political uh, uh, arena going on in which they try to get the public on their side. And they played a bit uh, with some, uh, of the, some of the issues that were important for Americans. So uh, Americans as someone who uh, rebelled against an empire and a king, they weren't very keen on large uh, organizations with a lot of power. So uh, unit banks played a bit on, um, on this and get, were able to get the public on their side. And that's one of the reasons why in the US there weren't uh, many large banks initially because unit banking was the prevailing type of bank. So this was a, a type of bank in which uh, a bank could only have one branch, the headquarters, and couldn't have any other branches. So even in the uh, so in different uh, states, sometimes there were some different uh, rules. 
some allowed uh, for branches just within a, a town, others completely restricted it, but uh, for the most part, you couldn't uh, branch out much. And this lasted until the 1980s, 1990s. So it was, uh, uh, it, uh, it had long-term effects. All right, so these were the most important parts I wanted to cover from White's paper. So especially it's that perspective on thinking uh, on financial regulation as, a, as the product of a political battle between banks, the public and regulators with uh, some of the examples that um, he gives. So then the next paper I wanted to discuss was, is the Calamiris and White on, uh, on deposit insurance. So uh, um, we've already mentioned a bit uh, on, uh, on what it does, discussing a bit uh, uh, the, the implementation of deposit insurance in the, in the US. So let's delve a little bit into the perspectives and the history of deposit insurance in the US. So first, when it was implemented, um, what was the perception that uh, some lawmakers uh, tried to create in the public about deposit insurance? That it would be like these, uh, that, that it would mean that these, these banks that didn't do their jobs in terms of, you know, keeping their money well and being responsible with their money, that uh, risk people who were responsible would have to subsidize those who weren't responsible. Uh, okay, so I think that's more and more the more honest uh, uh, take on deposit insurance. I was asking more <laughs> the way the politicians, those in favor, tried to sell it. Okay, okay. I'm not sure personally, still thinking. All right, so basically, uh, so even the word they use, it's the prophylactic, right? So they try to sell it as a cure for every uh, a problem in the financial system, right? So that's a bit how they try to sell it. Um, I was going to ask if this is true, but uh, Pranav already uh, kind of answered that question. And so then, can you give me some evidence supporting that? And I can give you a hint. What was the history or the experience uh, in the US with deposit insurance until the, the Great Depression when uh, then eventually uh, deposit insurance was uh, implemented at the federal level? So what was the experience with deposit insurance in the US until the Great Depression? So had there been uh, any kind of deposit insurance? Yeah, John, go ahead. I think uh, both politicians and the public were generally apathetic towards it since there hadn't been a, like a, a lot of experience and a lot of um, uh, interest in it since there wasn't like a, a dire need for some, uh, you know, uh, method to you know, drastically improve the economy since there was no Great Depression. So um, that is true. However, so I would say in terms of the interest, but some groups would be interested. So the general public, maybe not, and maybe the majority of lawmakers also not. Um, but for some banks, they were interested, and that's part of the political struggle that we're going to discuss. In terms of experience, there had been some experiences at state levels, right? So they discussed this uh, in the paper that, uh, uh, eight, uh, um, eight states had developed, had created deposit insurance systems. Uh, but by the, and this were since 1908, um, eight states had created deposit insurance at the state level. But by the 1920s, every single one of them had gone uh, bankrupt, right? So uh, basically it's because for the uh, deposit insurance, you need contributions uh, to, the, to the insurance. And then when something goes wrong, it's used uh, to, uh, to guarantee the deposits. The problem is it, in, it didn't work in any state. And this was the experience uh, of, um, with deposit insurance in the US until the, um, until the Great Depression. And then there's, obvious, there's also part of the, the political struggle they uh, discuss 
It's also based on the alternative or what might be, uh, in their view, the, a better alternative. Which alternative is that? We may have already mentioned it. Arco, you remember which one it is? Uh, the branching? Yes. So uh, it's the nationwide uh, uh, branch banking, right? In which they, uh, um, to prevent all the issues that Pranav uh, mentioned, uh, they suggest that uh, if the nationwide branch banking had been promoted, then uh, you didn't need to have the subsidies, uh, as Pranav explained, between uh, the good banks uh, to the bad banks, but you could just have banks that uh, were geographically uh, the dispersed across the country. That would uh, give them access to uh, depositors in different parts of the countries, would allow them to issue loans in different parts of the country, and then reduce their exposure to localized uh, uh, crisis and uh, give them access to more funds. So they defend that this would be a better alternative than uh, deposit insurance. And that even from the experience, uh, the historical experience until then, uh, that also pointed in that uh, direction. However, we still ended up uh, with deposit insurance. So now let's try to understand a bit why or how this, this, did this come about? So who can uh, uh, tell me a little bit uh, about the story? How uh, uh, was deposit insurance eventually uh, implemented? Yeah, Isabel, go ahead. Because the unit bankers were strongly opposed of the ranking laws that um, the government want to implement because they fear that um, it's gonna threaten their interest in terms of uh, getting uh, banks, uh, like banks establishing in their area. So um, they they were extremely uh, like strongly opposed of it. So they managed to get gain support and um, just ultimately choose uh, the uh, federal deposit insurance. Yeah, so one of the things they did was to discredit large scale banking. So the, they went in a public campaign to discredit large-scale banking as if it's something bad, uh, um, it's as if it's uh, something that just promotes the interests of a few. Um, and again, there's a bigger picture here. So this is a time of antitrust in the US, uh, in which if you look at uh, other areas like railroads, they were being uh, dismantled, right? And if you follow a bit uh, some of the discussion with big tech now, uh, they frequently mention uh, these antitrust issues, and these are at this time. So banking didn't go through these uh, uh, breakups of large banks because they were always prevented from becoming big. And, but the part of the idea was, uh, was similar, was to prevent a lot of power in the hands of just uh, one individual or, uh, or few individuals or a few institutions. Right, so there was already this, uh, um, this kind of uh, predisposition of the public to uh, be against large scale uh, institutions. And unit bankings um, did a good political job uh, playing that card. So now let's delve a little bit into more the political events. So even before, um, were, well, I guess John already kind of answered this question, uh, but I'll ask it uh, if you want, you can reply again. So were most uh, politicians in favor of deposit insurance? Uh, did it have a lot of support uh, initially or uh, was it uh, a bit uh, more marginal or not that uh, supported? Yeah, go John, go ahead. At first, it wasn't really supported that heavily since there wasn't really, I think, a, a niche that needed to be filled with regards to um, uh, 
with regards to the um, the system because I think that uh, you know a financial depression like the Great Depression was um, I think like created the atmosphere where um, you know uh, that type of uh, almost like uh, that type like where a situation where a financial practice wasn't really considered prior and that wasn't really that was used but wasn't really um, you know considered uh, something that should be um, used on like a large scale or um, very heavily like uh, could find an opportunity to gain more popularity and gain more usage throughout the you know uh, government and public so I think initially you know it wasn't really popular it wasn't really considered like a uh, an option that be, could be used solution for financial issues uh, but later on I think especially after the Great Depression it became um, a great deal more popular and a great deal uh, had a great deal of, like a popularity spike and was used a great deal more so I think it depends a bit on uh, which point in time you're talking about. So uh, I would even say during the initially during the Great Depression, it wasn't even that popular uh, when uh, when the discussion started, especially in Congress, uh, because so they uh, go a bit into the main uh, supporters and opponents of it. Uh, do you remember the list of those in favor? I can give you a hint. It's very short. So it's basically it's uh, Stiegel who was uh, in the house, uh, a chairman uh, in the house of the financial uh, uh, committee, and uh, it was the vice president, uh, so uh, John N Nance uh, Gardner, um, and that was pretty much it. So uh, the main uh, politician, so Roosevelt, who was president already at the time, was against it. Senators, the main one, uh, Carter Glass that becomes famous as part of the Glass-Steagall Act. Uh, he was against as well. So the Secretary of Treasury was against it as well. Most banking organizations were against it as well. So initially, uh, even, so we're already talking during uh, uh, Roosevelt's presidency. So uh, it's already way in the Great Depression and it wasn't that popular, right? Um, but they did have someone very important on their side, which was Stiegel. And so how did then uh, the situation evolve? Uh, how did it change? Because as you may have noticed, the, the deposit insurance part of the Glass-Steagall Act passed unanimously. Nobody voted against it. So how did this shift it so much? What uh, were some of the political events that uh, led to that? So maybe just on a bit of an overview. So there was a political campaign by, uh, especially by Stiegel, but to promote deposit insurance especially to change the public's perception of it, right? Uh, so both to, uh, um, as part of what Isabel mentioned, uh, to discredit large scale banking and also to promote uh, the uh, deposit insurers. But then at the political level also, how was uh, Stiegel able to convince uh, Carter Glass the other uh, half of the Glass-Steagall uh, Act to support the deposit insurance when he started against it. Does anyone remember the... So there was something uh, that uh, Glass really wanted to have implemented. That was the separation between commercial and investment banking. So that was the priority for Carter Glass. And Stiegel negotiated with him the, the, the support that if uh, Carter Glass supported uh, deposit insurance, then Stiegel, who was uh, very influential in the house, so Carter Glass is a senator, is the senator responsible, um, then Stiegel would support the separation of commercial and investment banking. Um, 
And this way, they were able to uh, agree on these pieces of legislation that would include deposit insurance and the separation between uh, commercial and investment banks. And that's how he was able to bring uh, the probably the most important senator to, uh, to the side of deposit insurance and then uh, help the bill uh, pass in the Senate, right? So, glass, so uh, deposit insurance was uh, at the political level driven a lot by, uh, um, by Stiegel, by Henry Stiegel, uh, uh, a representative from Alabama, a sm uh, state uh, with uh, small banks, and he was pushing for, uh, he was uh, pursuing the interests of these small banks. And part of the story that uh, Calamiris and White uh, tell, it's uh, the story of, again, a game between the two groups. So on one side, small rural banks and uh, low-income individuals, so with small deposits. And these were the ones who won with this deposit insurance. On the other side, large, uh, usually uh, city banks, um, wealthy deposits, depositors. These were the ones uh, that uh, that lost this uh, this political battle, right? And a lot of it was driven by what they called the political entrepreneurship of Stiegel. So Stiegel, as I uh, just mentioned, was able to politically drive this uh, process and made deposit insurance uh, uh, be uh, implemented, even though it started with very little um, support, both politically and in the public, but he was able to change both. At a political arena, we uh, rely a lot on the support of, Car of Senator Carter Glass and in the public by working uh, the public in favor of this legislation to the point that uh, Initially, uh, it was voted, uh, these acts were voted. They didn't pass in, the, in Congress, but then the public support changed so much that the next time it was up for a vote, nobody wanted to vote against it and it passed unanimously. That's how much it changed that the same people uh, uh, went from voting uh, uh, to, uh, to kill the bill to now pass it unanimously. All right, so this was uh, now the story of uh, this, uh, the deposit insurance and highlighting especially the political entrepreneurship of, um, uh, of Stiegel. So any questions about this paper? We're okay, we're good. All right, so then let's move on to the other one. However, I will take um, a few minutes to uh, put this into a little bit of a context, which uh, was the, the role of the other two papers. So I've just showed you a bit uh, how uh, financial regulation is a product of uh, uh, politics and uh, the history. So right now I'm going to introduce uh, a concept that um, was first introduced uh, by, uh, uh, by Hajan in, uh, in, a, in uh, a paper, uh, trying to just recall the name. So uh, it's the credit crisis and cycle proof regulation. So this was a speech that uh, Hajan uh, gave uh, at uh, the Fed in 2009, and in, in which he proposed one uh, concept, uh, just in a speech, so very briefly, of the fact that uh, regulation moves in a cyclical manner, that financial regulation moves in a cyclical manner. Um, so you can uh, look at uh, that speech, you can just Google Russia and credits uh, crisis uh, and cycle proof uh, regulation. And you can read it, uh, the second part, uh, the first part, it's mostly about the financial crisis in 07 or 08. <clears throat> and then the second part is more explaining a bit this, uh, this regulatory cycle. And then I built on it and um, I wrote uh, a paper uh, called the financial regulatory cycle in which I uh, elaborate on each and present more evidence uh, about it. 
So uh, if you want, uh, uh, I just uh, wrote it uh, in the chat. If you want the information, uh, you, uh, you can also find links for it uh, in my website. And in this paper, I, uh, again, I uh, propose that financial regulation is not constant over time, but it moves in a cyclical manner. And I elaborate a bit uh, on this aspect historically. Uh, I propose that there are long and short cycles. Um, yes, thank you, Ryan. And then you can go to the section on research and uh, you will find it, you'll find there the link. Um, and I. I suggest that uh, there are a bit like business cycles, there are long cycles and short cycles. So in the US, <clears throat> I, I identified three long cycles. So from um, the independence of the country till the civil war, then from the civil war to the 1980s and the 1980s to the present. So the first one I identify as, as a cycle of low financial regulation mostly because the federal government is not intervening a lot and states are not doing much also. Then after the civil war, as we discussed a bit uh, in the first uh, paper, the single author by uh, White, um, the federal government starts to intervene more until the Great Depression, sometimes in a clumsy manner, uh, that leads to a still very unstable uh, banking system in the US with a lot of crisis. And then uh, it uh, intervenes uh, following the Great Depression, it intervenes in a manner that uh, promotes stability, but uh, often at the cost of, uh, uh, of competition. Uh, and uh, thus uh, uh, also it leads to rents to banks and costs to consumers. And then since the 1980s, there's been a, a, a move to deregulation. But then within these, these long cycles, these are major swings, you still have shorter cycles. So I give the example uh, for the 1980s or for this period between the 1980s and the present. And uh, you see that through the 1980s, there's deregulation, uh, part of what uh, the, the other paper builds on. Then uh, you have a crisis in the late 80s, early 90s, in which the SNL crisis, in which deregulation stops and some regulation is passed. So there's an uptick in uh, regulation. Then the 1990s, early 2000s, it's a period again of deregulation until there's another crisis uh, in which uh, there's more re regulation being implemented. Um, uh, the best, the best known example, it's the Dodd Frank Act, and then uh, starting around 2011, we start again a new period of deregulation. So, as you can see, there are these cycles, these long uh, cycles that last several decades, and these shorter cycles that uh, are uh, um, that may last just for a few years. So the idea of uh, this paper on the financial regulatory cycle is again to explain that financial regulation is not constant over time, but it fluctuates in a cyclical manner. And part of the idea is that usually uh, during, when we have a financial crisis, there's a momentum uh, for against the free market and that usually leads to overregulation. But then once uh, economic conditions stabilize, then the trust in the free market uh, comes back. And usually you see a process of deregulation starting, right? You can think of uh, Dodd-Frank as responding to the crisis, but then as economic conditions stabilize, there's uh, deregulation that starts. And usually, Again, you can think of this, uh, um, of maybe the 1990s would be a better example. So as you start, as you uh, deregulate, you have uh, large financial and economic gains. And this kind of uh, uh, creates the momentum for uh, more deregulation. However, at some point, uh, you may have deregulated too much and you may have taken uh, some of the features that were stabilizing the market, you may have, you may take them, you may have already take them away. 
And at this point, that's when the market is more vulnerable to crisis, right? And you can think of the, the 2007, 2008 crisis as partially uh, uh, caused by some of the things that uh, happened in uh, the 1990s and early 2000s. And this is part of the cycle that um, I elaborate. And this is to help you understand a bit this, um, this political perspective on, uh, on financial regulation that comes not just, uh, f that, come, that has a historical and a political process. Um, so this was just to give you a context from the other paper that I expected the, that you're going to have. Um, so I noticed there was a hand raised as I was talking, um, I've now uh, stopped my spiel. So uh, if uh, there's still a question, I'm happy to answer. Uh, okay, Art, uh, Sud, go ahead. You're the one who had. Yeah, um, I actually, so you brought up this political perspective. So do you believe that conservative like policies or conservative economic like administrations and their policies oftentimes enforce regulations? Or do you believe so? That's like what I've noticed as a trend. So it's like. But what do you mean by enforce regulation? Enforcing regulation, that's the role of the uh, supervisors. So the agency is responsible for that. Uh, not sure. Or like, do you believe those policies like cause these crises that end up enforcing? were resulting in the need for regulations? So I think it's a bit more nuanced. So um, I think there were policies that, uh, or there were s policies that definitely contributed to the crisis. I think that's undeniable. Uh, however, you also need to understand what's the other option. Uh, so it is possible to never have a crisis again, but uh, to do that, you may remove competition from the system, for instance. So one of the examples that I give is that after the Great Depression, so the period between the Great Depression till uh, the 1980s was extremely stable, no banking crisis, but there was also almost no competition. So if you read a bit, uh, I discuss Regulation Q was an upper bound uh, on uh, interest rates that banks could pay. So this was to prevent uh, banks from attracting clients from other banks. So you could regulate competition away, for instance, and this would make the banking system more stable. But at the same time, that stable doesn't necessarily mean good because this was good for the banks that had higher profits at this time because they didn't have to face competition, right? But for the public, they would be the ones uh, paying for these, uh, for these costs. Right, so I think there's there's more nuance there. There are things that were over deregulated that definitely contribute to the crisis. I discussed, uh, for instance, what happened in the derivatives market. There were people in the 1980s, 1990s pushing or pretty much foreseeing what happened and warning about it and they were ignored. So there are things like good regulation that I'll, I, I'm all for and we should put it. But to just promote stability, one way could be to prevent competition. And I'm not sure that's, uh, that's a good thing. So I think it depends a bit more on what exactly we're to, you're talking. Uh, sometimes yes, definitely other times uh, uh, there's a trade-off between the good and the bad. All right, thank you. Right. Uh, so, Arco, I think uh, you're the next one. Yeah, um, mine just kind of a clarifying question. So you were sure. just saying that basically the financial regulation cycle is kind of like the, in not really the inverse, but like the opposite of the business cycle with a little bit of a lag time. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by opposite. Uh, so I was making a parallel that uh, financial regulation moves also in a cyclical manner, just like a business cycle is also, or economic growth is not constant, it follows a cycle. So I was giving that parallel. If you want to link it to the business cycle, it's usually you have deregulation when economic conditions are good. So usually when you have economic growth uh, and financial stability, 
and you have the, uh, you have uh, an increase in in regulation when um, financial conditions are bad. So usually crisis, um, and usually those uh, are associated with recessions. Um, not sure if that's what you were asking. Mm -hmm. that, that is what I was asking. Thank okay, uh, John, go ahead. How do you think, uh, like, uh, what you wrote about about um, regulation cycles ties into, um, like, theories about how uh, political cycles also affect business cycles and how, in turn, they may cause them? As in, like you said, when yeah. uh, the times are like when the economy is good, people tend to uh, worry less about uh, regulation and uh, more um, strict economic. Uh, uh, policies versus when, um, let's say, there's a downturn, let's say, with 2008 or the Great Depression, and people tend to delve more into Keynesian policies rather than more um, uh, free market okay. ones. That identification case of the driver of causality, that's a nightmare for researchers. Uh, so it's extremely difficult to say what came first. It's almost uh, the chicken and the egg question. Um, I am working on it. So I was planning to spend the last five minutes discussing uh, a bit my, uh, my work in progress uh, for which I don't have anything for you to read yet, but I may have soon. So maybe that can uh, uh, answer a bit your question. Uh, is it fine if uh, we leave it to that point? But by the way, there's no identification. It's almost impossible, just hints. Yeah, no, it, it, that, it makes sense, thank you. All right, just trying to make sure that uh, I still cover everything. So uh, I'm not sure uh, about uh, the three. Uh, so Sia, Tasmia, and Amanda, I don't know now the order. Uh, so I don't know, someone uh, can go. Yeah, I'll go ahead. I was wondering, um, considering that COVID-19 has been a very unstable, both economic and political period of time, how the financial regulation cycle has changed during it? Well, so not much because while it has been, uh, uh, COVID has hit a very badly the economy, it hasn't hit that badly the financial system. So uh, in their defense, the central banks intervened a lot and that may have uh, prevented mostly due to central bank intervention. So I wouldn't, while COVID has obviously hit very badly the economy with employment, uh, incomes, uh, those variables it has hit very badly, but not so much the financial system. Uh, I can't think of any bank that went bankrupt uh, during uh, this last year, um, nor major issues. So uh, in that sense, it hasn't really hit the financial system that much. Um, so, and in that's to that extent also not that much uh, that has changed in, in regulation. So, yeah, see or Tasmia? Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit more about how like the regulation connected to the 2008 crisis. I missed a bit of what you were saying about that how deregulation led to the crisis? Uh, yeah, how it connected a bit to the crisis. I sure. What you were saying. So um, again, if you go through the paper, you'll, um, you'll have more of these details and the bills. I can give you a few examples. So in the 1980s, um, and even in 1990s a bit, but 1980s, there was a lot of deregulation on real estate lending. So things, for instance, like the maximum uh, uh, loans, uh, loans uh, to loans, uh, levels of loans were increased. Uh, there was a deregulation on the type of loans. So some of the exotic products that you've seen that you during the crisis, those were deregulated uh, mostly in the 1980s. Uh, so I don't know how familiar you are with some of those loans with piggyback uh, mortgages and uh, um, all those kinds of things. If you're not, one paper I would recommend you to read, uh, and that's reasonably accessible. It's one by Bruna Meyer that is uh, called the Deciphering the Credit Crunch um, or Credit Crunch Bubble. Uh, 
and um, it will um, help you understand uh, some of those products. But this was deregulated in the 1980s. Uh, I have it in my paper. Um, the derivatives, they, weren't, they were a little bit deregulated, but more importantly, they weren't regulated. So derivatives picked up a lot during the 1990s, and there were people who saw this. So I give the example of Brooklyn's Born, who was the chairwoman of the uh, Commissions and Trade Futures uh, something. And she basically wanted to regulate uh, these um, these derivatives that then became very important in the early 2000s and she was prevented they didn't allow her to uh, to regulate uh, those derivatives so these were some of the factors that uh, help uh, create the conditions for the for the crisis but again you can find more uh, of these details in uh, in the paper right tasmia go ahead Yes, thank you for this lecture, by the way. And it just sparked the question I had when I heard the conversation between you and John. Um, what would you consider as a as wrong with our banking regulation today? Because I know that our indebtedness is like one of the biggest like problems with like consumer and like the financial industry. And many people believe that like regulatory bodies will help like with the banking regulation and fix this problem. But many, um, I remember reading an article saying like. Um, John Dermine or something like one of the professors of banking believes that this is a big issue and that um, we have a lot of problems with the banking regulation today. So what would be your input on that? Yes, so that's a very long question that could be a, almost a course just on it. So I think there are part of what I try to identify uh, it's this constant changes of uh, regulation and part of it it's this constant change of goals. And uh, I think it would be helpful if we can establish what, uh, uh, what's the goal, right? So uh, one thing would be, uh, um, do you want a competitive system? Those are usually more fragile. Do you want a stable one? Those are usually less competitive and uh, with higher returns for, uh, for banks with fees, uh, so um, with rents that are paid by the consumer to banks, right? There are then some alternatives uh, that you could have, uh, um, like the like banks that uh, don't hold uh, that don't issue loans. Um, so this has already been uh, proposed. It's called narrow banking, in which a way to uh, because banking is in itself unstable because of the maturity mismatch, in which you have short-term loans and the uh, long uh, term uh, sorry short term deposits that can be withdrawn at any moment and you have uh, long term uh, loans usually mortgages so there's a liquidity problem that this creates so some of the answers are on narrow banking uh, so again it's a very tricky answer to give you uh, in one minute or less there's a lot that can be improved uh, but i think even more importantly, it's to know what you want to do, right? So um, I'm happy to elaborate on this in the end. So now uh, let me go very quickly then uh, through, so mostly the paper on the 1980s building on the cycle that I just described you, it's elaborating on this shift that happened on the 1980s, right? And it goes into it uh, in more detail um, than, um, than the one on the cycle. Um, but then the, this asks, the, this then begs a lot of questions on what may drive it. So as John asked, so now I can uh, uh, this tell you a bit about my current research, which some of it it's on political economy, some of it um, it's on behavioral issues and uh, uh, linking all with it with history. So on a political level, I looked uh, at uh, voting on financial regulation in the US Congress. So one thing I actually found is that, uh, for instance, uh, Republicans, they think, tend to be more ideological, but that also means more stable over time. So Democrats seem to change more their minds about, uh, again, thinking on what uh, I was just 
answering uh, to Tasmia, Democrats seem to change more their mind on what their goal is. So Democrats are, during periods of crisis, they really want regulation. During periods of economic stability and growth, they are more pro-deregulation. So they seem to change more their minds, while Republicans seem to be uh, more uh, ideologically more stable. Uh, also more on the deregulation side. So part of uh, the driver of this cycle uh, could be uh, ideological shifts. So uh, uh, Republicans have had more members in, in Congress in the last few decades. So that could have helped this deregulatory process um, that I was hinting to, to John. My research also looks at two other different aspects. So one, it's the, the, the long cycles. And part of my belief is that this is partially driven by uh, people's uh, views and perceptions. And uh, on that case, uh, what I look, for instance, I think the Great Depression is a great example. So if I I'm looking at data on surveys, and if you look uh, at, uh, at uh, the depositors' goals right after the, the Great Depression, what they want the most from their bank seems to be that their bank is there. So stability may be the most important thing for them. So then uh, these people are willing to tolerate lack of competition and potentially to pay rents, right? However, if you think of the 1980s, this was uh, about half a century after the Great Depression. So a lot of the people who, be, who raised to power in the 1980s no longer great. So their preferences change, right? And this is one of the things that I'm looking at. It's that this change of preferences, especially across generations, and this may be one of the factors that drive the long cycle, right? On the shorter cycle, I'm looking at media tension. And one thing, uh, so uh, I discuss, uh, I believe this was Zarko who asked uh, the link between uh, economic conditions and uh, financial uh, conditions. That also, uh, one of the things that you also notice there, it's mainstream media attention to finance. So usually when uh, financial condition, financial and economic conditions are good, they're stable, you, the mainstream media almost doesn't say anything about uh, finance, finance uh, unless maybe the stock market hits new highs, and especially it doesn't say anything about financial regulation. You look at the 1990s, very little attention to uh, financial regulation. But then when you have a crisis, there's a lot of media attention, and finance becomes the main topic for mainstream media attention. So one of the aspects that I'm trying to explore as a driver of uh, this uh, financial regulatory cycle is the, um, uh, this media attention. Um, so I'll spare you some of the details, uh, uh, maybe the painful ones, uh, but identification is tricky, as John uh, asked, what is causing what? It's difficult to uh, establish which one is driving. Uh, I'm trying to, but and these are my current hypotheses.